And with no further ado, please continue. Hello, everyone. And welcome to my talk, Clash, Burn, and Export, Manipulate Filters to Pound Kernel CTF. I'm Hexrabbit from Taiwan, currently working as a security researcher at DEFCOR. I specialize in binary export, especially in Linux kernel exploitation. I found some vulnerabilities in Linux kernel component like Ring, KSMBD, NS tables, and others. Today, I will start from introducing kernel CTF and NS tables. After that, we will dive into the NS table internals and talk about three vulnerabilities we discovered in NS tab tables. And in between these three vulnerabilities, I will also share some story behind the scene during my current CTF journey. So let's talk about, first talk about the current CTF. Current CTF is part of Google VRP, and the way it works is quite similar to a CTF challenge. For about every two weeks, there will be new kernel version released, and attendee will be given an unprivileged shell. And you will need to exploit it, exploit the Linux kernel to get flagged, and submit it to Google to earn the bounty. There are three instances can be found. LTS and COS both use newer and quite similar kernel config, while the mitigation one uses an older kernel config with custom security patch to accept more one-day exploit. But the most important thing is Google offers pretty big bounty award. With some simple math calculation, we can quickly find for a zero-day LTS exploit the bounty can easily surpass 50,000 US dollars. And with the same vulnerability, you can earn both 21,000 max, maximum in both mitigation and COS instance, which is quite appealing for the bounty hunter like me. So why am I targeting NF tables? First, NF table config is enabled in kernel CTF. And as you can see on the right, there are multiple vulnerabilities discovered just after kernel CTF is announced. So for kernel CTF newbie like me, I think it's the right place to start. Okay, so first we take a brief, brief intro to NF tables. What exactly is NF tables? NF table is a packet filtering framework inside Linux kernel. It's used to replace the legacy IP, ARP, EB tables, merge them into a single entry point. It's used, uh, it uses a simple VM design to implement its functionality and support new syntax for CUI interface. As you can see on the right, instead of doing things one by one, new syntax can now allow config multiple things all at once. And these capabilities come from its design, which we will revisit later. NS table is constructed by a tree-like structure. It contains five core modules, table, chain, rule, expression, and set. Table is the top level container for the below structures, it's used for the management purpose. Um, each table will only belong to a specific neural family, and any object contained by the table will follow the same family. Chain in NS tables will hook at predefined hooking point provided by net filter infrastructure to do the packet filtering. When any packet flows through the hooking point, the chain will execute the expressions in the row it managed to accept or to block or to modify the packets. So what is the rule and what is the expression? As I mentioned earlier, NF table imp implements its functionality by a simple virtual machine. So you can think a rule as a small function. They can contain multiple expressions. And the expression is the instruction for NF tables. There are different types of expressions. Some can be used to manipulate VN registers and the others can be used to load or uh, to read or write data within packets. And thus, set is used to store a group of some type, like IP address or port or any binary data. It can also be used as a map to map some type A to another type B. And these data stored in the set can be queried by the expressions during packet filtering. OK. So after having some basic understanding of NF tables, I will now introduce the first vulnerability I discovered. At the time, I'm not so familiar with NF tables. However, 
I spotted something weird in the code base. These three functions are all used to delete objects in the NF tables. The NF table delete rule deactivate will be called during rule deletion. NFT flush will be called during full config flush. And NFT set um, LM catch all deactivate will be called during set element deletion. However, the pattern here is a bit different. The first two use is uh, NFT is active next to check if the object is active. But the last one, NFT set element catch all deactivate, use NFT is active to check. So, so what's the difference? Actually, these two functions is used to use for object lifetime management in NF tables. In order to understand how it works, we will need to first talk about the batch request mechanism. For a, per, for a query request, for example, the get rule operation above, Netlink API will internally use Netlink receive XKB to get the rule information loglessly. However, if it's some operation that will modify the control plan, like new table or delete chain, NF tables will use NF Netlink receive batch instead of the logless one to serve the request. The difference between them is that batch one can process a request which contains multiple operations, and they will be processed sequentially. And also because of this design, the CUI interface can configure multiple things all at once. So um, it sounds great, but the thing becomes more complicated when any operation fails in the middle of a batch request. And what the NF tables do is to split batch request handling into multiple phases. There are three phases during the handling of, of the batch request. Prepare phase, commit phase, and the abort phase. During the prepare phase, if every operation finishes successfully in the batch request, it will go to the commit phase and commit the changes. However, if something went wrong, after every operation is processed, it will go to a bolt phase and revert all the changes. Here's the lifetime management comes in. Any object in NS table has two state variable, current generation and next generation. Only the ob object activated in current generation can affect the runtime behavior. And you can think the next generation as a temporary state for the prepare phase. Every operation modify the control plan, like new or delete operations, but only make changes on the next generation state in the prepare phase, so without affecting the current generation state. Then, during the commit phase, it will commit the modification, so the current generation will be finally be set as the next generation, and the next generation state will be reset to a clean state. But in the case, if something went wrong during the both phase, it only needs to clean the next generation state. Let's go through some examples to know how it works. After a batch request is received, it goes into the prepare phase. The first operation is delete set C. Okay, so the set C's next generation state will be set to deactivated. Next, it continues to, proce to process a uh, set D operation. So the set D will be added into hash table with next generation in activated state. If nothing went wrong, we will go to the commit phase, and at this phase, current generation will be set as the next generation. So the set D will be available in both runtime and query operations, and also the set C will be free. If something went wrong, we will enter the abort phase. And at this phase, all operations done in the prepare phase will be reverted in a reverse order. So the add set D will be undo, and also the delete set C will be undo. So, OK, back to the check. So what's the problem here? As we can see, during the NFT set element catch or deactivate, it used NFT is active to check if the element is still alive. However, NFT is active checks current generation 
But the function actually runs in a prepare state, which will only modify the next generation state of an object. So the check here, the, the check here will always pass. And by request multiple delete operations, we can free the element multiple times in the commit phase. So the batch request to trigger double free will look like this, since the lifetime check will always pass if the element exists during the prepare phase, two delete set element of operation will both execute successfully. And so when you get to the commit phase, the same element will be free twice. And we get a set cache rule element double free. Great. So I found my first bug for current CTF. But the next day, I found the, con uh, I found the maintainer also find the same bug and send a patch to kernel mailing list. I mean, why? So, okay, this means my zero day is officially turns into a one day. And according to kernel CTF rules, my bounty will decrease by 20,000 US dollar. Ouch. <laughs> um, also, one day vulnerability means that everyone will know how to trigger the vulnerability. And they may also come up with some exploit. So I definitely need to exploit it before next kernel CTF slot opens. So after we get the double free primitive, we reuse the exploit method for CV2023-4004 to overlap the NFT table utata and NFT object to leak address and control IP. Due to a time limit of this talk, I won't expand the detail of it, but kudos to Lonnie and Kong, who discovered this technique and shared it on kernel CTF repository. So now we develop the exploit and wait for the slot to reopen. Fast forward to two hours before the competition starts. I nervously check if there's any kernel updates related to uh, NF tables. And guess what? The patch previously posted on the mailing list has been merged into the kernel. And it added one line on it. On it. It says, reported by Lonion Khan, which this means is the patch may actually come from a zero day kernel CTF submission. And since the reporter is Lonion Khan, whose exploit I just used, this is indeed the case. So just before I have the chance to exp exploit it on official instance, I found it's a collision. So yes, I still found the instance and report the flag, but too bad for me, the first bug uh, do collide with an old kernel CTF submission. <laughs> That's how I look after the competition. <laughs> okay, so I take some break, and after three weeks later, I found the second bug. During the research, I came across an interesting co commit. NF table validate family when identifying table via handle. The commit is added after the mitigation instance kernel version, so it can be used to pawn the mitigation instance as a one day. It added a check on NFT table lookup by handle function, which is used for searching a register table by the provided handle. Without the commit, during the table lookup, we can provide a family different from the one which table belongs to, but when can we, what can we do with this inconsistency? Let's trace where the family parameter comes from and where it goes. NS table lookup by handle is only called from NS table delete table. And this function is used to delete user specified table from NS tables. The family, uh, the family variable is directly get from user provided input and it's saved into context family and passed to NFT flush table function. In NFT flush table, context argument is passed into every function handling object deletion. For me, trace which function use the context family is quite annoying. So instead of just tracing into, uh, into each function, I take the shortcut to trace where it is used. So I just grab the whole code base to find where the context family is used. Um, grabbing context family gives us a lot of result, most of which comes from the NS table expressions. 
like um, count limit, net, t proxy, and etc. However, most of them cannot be used for, for the exploit. But I finally found one that can be exploited. It is in the NFT log expression. The trigger path I found starts from the NFT log destroy. This function takes context family as an argument and code to NF logger put. Now it's becoming the PF argument and used as an index to dereference the logger's array. The value range of our input context family and also the PF here is 0 to 255. But if we check the size of logger's array, we can find it only has 13 elements in the first dimension. So um, we get the global array out of bound access here. But what can we do with it? After taking the logger out, it dereferenced the me field and feed it into the module put. The module put will again dereference and decrease the refcon value in the module object. With this vulnerability, logger can be any pointer store adjacent to a logger's array. So we may cause some type confusion here and decrease some variable by one. However, we are dealing with an awkward situation here. In order to utilize this bug, we have to find a pointer store on global and can be dereferenced twice. The first is to take our logger mean, and the second is to take our module refcon. To sum up what we, what we have by now, first, the maximum value of PF value we can control is 255. And we can trigger an out-of-bound uh, out reference count decrement by using a PF, PF value larger than 12, which will execute like the code here. To exploit this, the first thing we need to do is to find the, a global pointer placed near the logos array. So what do we have on the global? By inspect the marrying GDB, we quickly find there's a NFCT expect hash placed near the logos array. And it's a hash table. So in this case, it seems to be a good target since the, re the, the pointer point to an array of pointers, therefore, it can be dereferenced twice. So and um, let's check how the code normally works. First, it gets the me field at offset one at hex, and then get the ref count at offset three four zero hex. Now let's check the out of bound access case. First, we set PF to nineteen to get the hash table pointer NFCT expect hash. The first dereference we got is the index tree entry of the hash table. The entry points to the HNO field of a NF contract expect object. So after one more dereference, it will access offset 340 hex down below the expect object. But since the expect object only has a D at size, it will access out of bounds. Fortunately, all NF contract expect object allocated in a dedicated Cayman cache. So the memory space below will also contain NF contract expect objects. So it will access to the RCU field and decrease the next pointer in the structure. But what does this next pointer use for? As we know, after RCU objects freed, Linux kernel will not instantly free the object. Instead, it will hold the object for a grace period to wait for all other RCU readers to finish. So the next pointer in the RCU head structure is used for temporary storing them and waiting for the RCU thread to process to free them. So after the contract expect object are free, they will be like this, trend with uh, trend by the next pointer. And since we can decrease the next pointer in RCU head, we can make it point to another field inside the contract expect object. And to exploit it, we choose to land it on a user controllable field, which contains a union of IPv4 and IPv6 address. So when RCU callback triggered, it will read the fake function pointer we set, and we can control the RIP. However, to actually exploit the vulnerability, we came across some roadblocks. First, we need 
we need the index tree of the hash table pointing to some exact object. So we can use it to do the out-of-bound write. But if, unfortunately, the hash value is unpredictable. Next, the out-of-bound written expect object needs to be in the grace period, so we can decrease its next pointer. But the next period is a small time window, and how to control when the kernel actually frees the object. Well, so long story short, we eventually found a way to exploit it by brute force and rage. To exploit this, first we use a tight loop to create a lot of expect objects. And at some point, the expect count exceeded the value max, ex max expected and start to evict the oldest expect object. So the oldest expect object will be placed into the RCU free list. And so on, and so on. And at some point, RCU thread gets scheduled by the kernel and starting to process objects. At this point, we add another thread to trigger out-of-bound decre decrement in a batch request and keep, and keep the system running for, for a bit. So we hope for the race scenario like this to emerge. First, the expect object allocated into index tree of the hash table, and then the expect object you want to out-of-bound write is freed into the RCU free list. Then it continues to free another expect object. After that, we trigger the vulnerability 28 times in a batch request to make the next pointer point to a user controllable value. And finally, thus you start to process these free objects and runs our fake callback function. Great, let's try it on local build. And we successful, successfully control the RP to form, 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 form. So what about remote? Let's try. And we got an error message while trying to add the log expression. Since I have no idea what happened on the remote environment, I decided to download the official busy image to debug it locally. So I opened the GDB and set some breakpoint on the functions. But when I set the break on NFT log destroy function, GDB complained that it was not defined. What's wrong here? I later found that it's because the kernel config I use is different from the one used in the official environment. So the log expression I use to exploit the vulnerability, not even compiled into the official image. But I, I, I'm using the official build script to build the local test image. Why on earth there can be any difference? I mean, I'm, why? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, I found it is caused by the official build script. The mitigation instance is built by COS kernel config plus the Google custom security, security patch. And the official mitigation instance used cost config 6.1.55. The NF table expression are ena en enabled in COS config after the version 6.1.64. However, the build script will always fetch the latest COS config, so the mitigation kernel I build has the NF table expression enabled, but in the official image, they're actually disabled. So, well, I think next time I should definitely check out the config first. Okay, so after my second failure, I revisited some old patch and I found a new bug. The patch I was looking at is, a, is the patch which introduced the first bug. The title says, NF table, uh, adapt set backend to use GC transaction API. So what does the GC mean? Here it means the set garbage collection. There are some set implementations support user to set a timeout on, um, on any set element. And there are two types of GC to clean the expired element. 
The first one, the, syn the, uh, synchron uh, the synchronous one, will be called in the commit phase, and the uh, asynchronous one will be triggered periodically in the background. But here, we, are, we only focus on the asynchronous one. So back to the patch. In the commit message, it says, use GC transaction API to replace the old and buggy GC API and the busy mark approach. So what is the difference between the new and the old one? Let's take a look of the old GC design. In the old design, the synchronous GC will run loglessly and can be triggered at any time. So in order to protect GC threads from raising with the landing API, both of them will check against a busy mark set on the element before delete it to, pre to prevent double free. But sometimes the developer may f might forget to check against it. In this case, there's a new function called NFT map deactivate forgot to check a busy mark. And this leads to a double free vulnerability. So in order to avoid this kind of issues, NF table developer decided to replace it with a new design. In the new GC design, it introduced the GC sequence. The GC sequence is a per net variable, and it will be inc increased before and after any modification to the control plan. So it will increase at the beginning and at the end of both the commit and the abode phase. During the GC procedure, GC thread will record and check it to prevent race. Even though the GC thread still run locklessly, during the check, it will now acquire the commit mutex lock. The new GC design looks like this. During batch request handling, GC sequence will increase both before and after the commit and abode phase. And in the GC thread, it will first run locklessly to store the GC sequence and collect all the expired elements. After that, it will acquire the lock and check if the current GC sequence match the safe one. If they are the same, then the elements will be released. For this normal case, since GC thread does not raise with the batch request, the GC sequence will be the same. And the element can be freed by the GC thread. Next, we check if it still works in the race case. If during the prepare phase, GC thread triggered and stole the, the global GC sequence into transfer objects, it will continue to run loglessly to find all the expired element and save them to and wait for the commit uh, and wait for the mutex lock. At the same time, the main thread stepped into the commit phase, and some of the elements in the set can be released in this phase. The GC thread will need to wait until the main thread releases the mutex lock, so it can finally check the saved GC sequence and delete the object uh, and delete the element. But in this case, since GC sequence is recorded in the prepare phase and we check it after the batch request is done, the GC sequence will be different. So the element deletion will be skipped to avoid double free. Next, let's check the case if GC sequence is recorded in the commit phase. In this case, since GC sequence increase after the commit phase, the the GC thread can only and the GC thread can only check GC sequence after the commi, commit uh, after the commit mutex unlocked. The, this race will also be detected. So to sum up, the new GC design requires both the batch request and the GC sequence check to hold the lock. This ensures that even there's a race while collecting the expired elements. The check will always happen after the GC sequence has increased. But does such but the batch request always lock means there's no race? Actually, if you look closely, we will find well <laughs> it's not always locked. 
To find where it released the log, let's first talk about the module auto load. During the prepare phase, if there is some expression type in the request, it's not found during the type resolution. It will instantly abort and try to load the corresponded type module during the end of the abort phase. After that, it will retry the whole batch request again. However, maybe there's some efficiency consideration or to just only prevent that log before the function try to load the request module. The mutex log will be released. But could it cause any problem? Back to the diagram. Now there's a little time window in the abort phase that it will not hold the mutex lock. So there's a chance during the abort phase, the GC track kicks in, records the expired elements, and do a GC sequence check. In this case, however, the check will be bypassed. And the GC thread can delete arbitrary expired elements. OK, so now the question is, how do we actually exploit the race? Our exploit plan is, first, we add a set element with a short timeout. And then we trigger module auto load to force it to reverse the commit and free the element we just added. And at the same time, we trigger GC to collect let, uh, let element. Next, module auto load will release the mutex. And we hope that the GC thread will grab it and bypass the check. So as a result, the element we just added will be double free. But in order to trigger double free, there are two time window we need to enlarge. The first time window is from the abort phase start to the set element released. So the GC thread can recall the expired element before they get unlinked by the revert procedure. The second time window is from the load module to its end. So the GC thread can grab the lock and bypass the check. For the first one, since the abort phase will revert the operations in a reverse order, we add a bunch of requests after the add set element request to delay the unlink operation. For the second one, we just request multiple unknown type to make module auto load runs longer. And here's the demo. OK, so first we boot our machine. and check the UID is a normal user, and then we run the exploit. So here, we will first measure the execution time to set up timing parameter for the race. And after that, we set up the environment to enlarge the race time windows. Then we trigger double free to leak address and control IP. And we got the root shell. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Great. So now I write the exploit and submit it to kernel CTF. And this is my kernel CTF submission. I exploited the LTS instance on kernel version 6.1.81. But as you can see, it is marked with a dupe in that line. It is because for every LTS slot, only the first zero day or one day exploit will be accepted. And there's someone who also submit a LTS ex exploit, which bit me by nine seconds. <laughs> That's too bad. So we have to wait for the slot to reopen. So yes, just wait for about two weeks, and the slot will reopen. Right? Wait until the slot to reopen? Yep. But do you know the NF table will be disabled from April 1st? What? <laughs> Actually, there's an announcement on kernel CTF Discord. It says they are going to disable NF tables along with the switch to kernel version 6.6. .6. It starts from March 15th 
but actually they delay the switch. So it's from Apple first. Okay, so what's the date today? It's actually March 22nd. <laughs> uh, the kernel CTF slot opens about every two weeks on average, which means I won't be able to exploit it before they disable the NF tables. So on my third kernel CTF attempt, I still could not get a bounty, which is pretty sad. To sum up my journey, first I have hope, and then I found bug one, a lifetime issue, and it collides with another submission. Then I found the bug two, a hard to use one day, but I used the wrong config, so it's unusable. Then I found the bug three, a locking issue. But I lose the submission race, and another table will be disabled, so it's killed. However, <laughs> there's a final plot twist. <laughs> a few days after, I found there are some changes in the kernel CTF spreadsheet. The person who previously got ahead of me is disqualified due, due to a bug collision. And so this time, I finally take over the slot and report it to, go to the Google. And last month, I got my kernel CTF bounty from Google, which is my first Google VRP bounty. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, well, I think this concludes my kernel CTF journey. And thank you, guys. Is there any questions? Yeah, if there's any questions, you can come up here to this microphone. <laughs> Thank you.